um, had to offer to architecture and urban design and planning, um, especially, for example, in areas that were deindustrialized or that still had to do uh, with some of the effects um, of industrialization, extraction, uh, or as I mentioned before, shrinking cities, no? so in, in all these particularly complex territories, um, how could we look at landscape as a medium to, for design? And so as I arrived in South America, we started this project that I will just mention here, but you are very welcome to take a look at the website. There is an archive of projects that we put together with Luis Callejas, Charles Waldheim, and many others, uh, in which we started to look at uh, projects that were developed uh, across um, Latin America. And we had this publication that was published last year, and now it's being published in Spanish. I just received my copies two days ago, so really fresh. And, and yeah, so also in Latin America, in many cities, um, there is an increased interest in like building green infrastructure and having uh, new waterfronts and uh, addressing public space and so on. Uh, but that's not all what I'm going to talk to you today, uh, because I would like to talk to you about um, how in my own work, uh, landscape actually has proved to be a really um, useful medium to understand some territorial conditions and try uh, to rethink the methodologies and the tools through which uh, we design. Um, so in a way, how can landscape, uh, how can we use landscape as a medium to metabolize or to process the externalities, which means like the effects of the processes of urbanization and industrial development, um, also, how can we um, use landscape as a medium to create the ground for different stakeholders, so different actors, different populations to interact and meet their needs and aspirations, and also how we can use it because of this ability you know, to think about things over time uh, to anticipate future dynamics and life cycles. So this might sound like <laughs> a bit too much, but I will show you two projects um, that really, I think, explain uh, this uh, particular aspect. Uh, so one project is called Landscape of Extraction and was published partly in the book, The Camp and the City, Territories of Extraction. And I have continued working on this project in a different way with a colleague from RPI um, called The Recombinant City. Um, so basically here we were working in Chile. Chile, I don't know if you know, but uh, is one of the main uh, exporter of copper in the world. Um, about 25% of the country's GDP comes from the exportation of copper and about 30% of the reserves of the world are in this country. So really like the price of copper determines the wealth uh, of the country and it provides most of the resources for investments, even grant, investments in infrastructure, um, education, politics, uh, ur uh, urbanization and so on. Um, and most of this copper is located here, I'm sorry the map is turning around, but most of the copper is located along the Andes and in particular in an area in the north of Chile that is uh, very, um, it's a very desert, it's called the desert of Atacama and it is the driest desert in the world. Um, the average rainfall is about 15 millimeters per year, so there is really no drop of water and all these traces that you can see on the ground are really the traces of the search for mining sites and the infrastructure and the digging operations and so on. And we were invited by uh, one of the main mining companies in Chile called Codelco. It's a national mining company owned by the state um, to work on this project, which involved Adolfo Ibanez University, which was the university where I was working and Harvard University. And then we had a project with MIT as well. Basically, they were really interested in trying to understand uh, what could be done to improve the conditions of this territory. And, and in general to kind of grow consensus and see, show that they were doing something and they want to, they brought us there to talk to people, talk to the town. Um, and yeah, and, and for us, it was extremely interesting not to try to understand that what can you do in a territory that looks like this, no? So this is uh, one of the biggest uh, pits in the world, probably the biggest in terms of excavated volume and it's called Chukikamata, and it's about 9,000 meters above sea level. 
And next to it, there was a town that was abandoned at the beginning of the 2000, 2003. So this town was built in 1910 by North American company uh, called Anaconda. And they, they built it like bringing all the wood and the projects and the design and even the first workers from the United States. So this theater and the school and the houses that you see here really resemble a North American city of the time. And, and the town was quite um, wealthy, living kind of isolated from the rest of Chile um, until it could not be there anymore, no? So this mountain you see at the bottom, it's actually a mountain of uh, rubble or debris from mining extraction that slowly, slowly took over the city, no? So this town was basically buried under the waste of the mining company that made the town exist in the first place. Um, so now the town is a like protected heritage, uh, but a mining company, the mining operations are still going on. And people who were living there at some point, 25,000 people were living there, were moved to a nearby town called Kalama. So here's where we came in. Basically this town, um, the population is struggling. They're taking the street because um, the conditions of living are very bad because they are in the middle of the desert. Mine, the mining industry is extremely polluting. And the only resource that the city had, like natural resource or source of some kind of quality in the urban environment, was an oasis that you can see at the end. And the moment in which they decided to close the mining town next to the mining site, uh, they moved all the population to this town. No? So this was kind of the last drop. Um, people were already struggling and now you have more people that are moved to this town and they're actually uh, occupying the most valuable area. Um, so what can we do for here? No? So we are a town that provides most of the wealth to the country and none of the resources are reinvested in the well-being of the population. Um, so this was a huge problem also for the mining company and that's how they wanted researchers to come in and try to understand. Um, so the first thing that somehow became clear to us is that they used to think about this sort of association between an industry, the mining camp, and its own town, the city, or the camp. Uh, but that's actually a much bigger cluster, no? So this town is not only dependent on this big mine that you see there, but actually has about 14 operations all around that. And sometimes the workers move from one to the other and they all kind of gravitate around this town of Kalama. They all use the infrastructure and the resources that the city offers, um, but they don't pay back in a way, no? Because um, the, their source of job and income is elsewhere, is in this kind of type. So this was kind of the first thing that um, we said, like, if you look at this, you have to look at the larger scale. You cannot just focus on um, what, how do we do with these workers that have to be relocated in the town? And then the second thing um, was that whenever you work in such a territory that depends so strongly on an industry, you have to keep in mind that there will be a sort of expiration date. So the moment in which, and this has happened with many mining cities around the world, and especially uh, in Chile, for example, with Sol Peter, like whenever you have just one industry and you're depending on that, if for any reason this is not viable anymore or you will find new technologies um, or other ways to get this resource, um, there might be no reason for the town to exist. No? So how can we deal with that? And, and finally, the third point was that they kept thinking about the city in a traditional way, as if it had boundaries and as if it had specific land use and a population, but actually this was not the case. Like even population, which is the most basic thing you read on the Wikipedia, this town has 150,000 inhabitants. Uh, but actually if you, we take a closer look, um, there are many more populations and many more um, elements that we have to consider no? if we want to look at this city. We cannot just look at its boundaries as if it was and think that we can develop an urban plan to improve it. Um, so yeah, if we took a closer look, so we really started to look at who, who lives in this city no? and what 
um, what are the needs of people who live here? And so for sure, the first one is the, the residents, no? our first understanding of population. These are people who live there, probably they work in a mining company or some subcontracting sub company or the city or any other activity that is more or less related to this. Uh, but they also have children, they have older parents maybe, they might be students, um, dependents, and they live within the boundaries of the city, they pay taxes, they vote, and they expect no uh, quality services and facilities. So they want good schools, they want a hospital, they want clean air. And if we look at the evolution of the city, we see how the residents really developed hand in hand with the mining industry. It's the mining industry is the copper color and the city is the um, brown that just see goes more or less together. And, and yeah, like they complain about spatial segregation because the edges of the city are really pushed towards the desert and they get really contaminated um, from the industry. Um, the richer area are placed near the oasis. Um, so this is also a source for struggle. And also, yeah, they complain about the poor quality of public space, um, the lack of water, the lack of uh, safe places, and they actually also complain about commuters who use the city without actually caring about it. And, and yeah, the commuters is the second really important group. And if you think about a city like New York, this is so obvious, no? You have a bunch of people who are the residents, but this does not reflect at all the amount of people who use the city every day. And in the case of a city like this, uh, the floating population is really uh, impactful. So more than 10% of population flying in and out every day. Um, they might fly yeah, for one day or for shifts that are five, seven, 10 days. Um, and they live in settings that are like this kind of temporary accommodations, uh, hostels or rooms that are added to the city fabric. And they don't really count whenever um, there are decisions to be made, but yet they occupy a consistent place in the city. And they might stay for a few months, but also years or sometimes a lifetime of work. Uh, they use the urban infrastructure, but they don't pay taxes, for example. And, and then the indigenous population was another group that was really uh, relevant to understand this area because um, they're kind of residents, but their understanding of the territory and the relation to the territory is really different. There are rest uh, remains uh, that date back to 2000 before Christ in the area because the oasis was on the Inca Trail. Um, so their ancestors have been also extracting the minerals uh, forever, and they have places that they really recognize of historical and uh, traditional value. They are cultivating the river still. They have special rights to the water, but this water is uh, becoming increasingly scarce and contaminated. And, and they have a very strong attachment to specific areas, like, for example, where the indigenous cemetery is or other um, religious sites. And, and yeah, like basically their relation to history and to landscape uh, dates back to many more centuries and is of a completely different nature than the one of the workers or even the residents that think of landscape more as a resource to be exploited. And finally, there were the executives that is kind of a population that does not even exist because maybe they live in another city like Santiago de Chile, but also in Canada, the United States or Europe on Asia. And it's kind of absent, no? they, but they take most of the decisions um, they might spend some time, like executives uh, or investors might spend some time in some of these new hotels that are being built, but in general, it's really about the infrastructure that is being built. And so here, for example, you see how the expansion of the airport and the new highway cuts through the indigenous cemetery and how this somehow disrupts something that it will be very hard to be reestablished. And again, also, if we look at the scale of this uh, operation, we understand how actually even the scale of the city like is nothing no? compared of the weight 
and the impact of the industry. This big area that you see here in brown is tailings. And then all of this, you have the rubble or debris and the holes, the black ones. And, and that, yeah, this contaminates the watershed and redistributes redistribu accessibility to water um, with the industry being the main player. Uh, here you see also how land use has changed. So we started mapping all of this to actually show them and tell them, you know, if you want to understand this territory, you really have to understand how the industry somehow is, uh, has transformed all this balance. And even if there are role, rules um, and regulations in Chile that ask to some industry to pay you know, for the impact they will have on the landscape. So for example, laws that force them to reclaim um, a specific landscape after mining operations are over. But if you take an ecosystem like this of the oasis that I was showing you before, um, it might be impossible to reestablish it. No, it's such a sensitive ecosystem and the species that are surviving through a landscape that has no water at all and could adapt to this condition. Um, once the oasis is lost, it might be impossible to reestablish this. Um, so what can we do? We basically started to think about the area as a sort of board game and we actually built games uh, that were placed in the area and we invited the executives from the company and the people who were working in the municipality and the representative of citizens and so on to come and play with us. And, and so these games were trying to um, represent the dynamics that were going on in the city. And we asked the students to draw boards that were representative of the areas where the most dynamics were happening. So for example, here is the oasis that is really a point of interest for the most. And, and trying to understand also how can we prepare for the future and what the future was foreseeing according to their needs and presentation was um, the need to allocate about 20,000 new workers, which was one fifth, one sixth of the current population um, to deal with some new operations that are going to be developed until 2040. So we were trying to think how can these workers, so these people coming to the site, instead of representing one new disruption, how can this be actually something that can um, initiate new, new productive circles that can benefit different groups? So here you can see some images in which they were thinking, okay, if we build a new hotel in the oasis, maybe we have to restore the landscape a bit uh, southern and so on. Or what if we place some temporary housing for workers in the neighborhoods that are the ones at the periphery of the city where it's really dry and we recycle the wastewater from the houses and we use this to produce vegetables, for example. So we basically give a new income to some of the population and we make the area greener, which captures dust and so on. Um, or how can we think about the whole city as a potential place for acupunctural intervention. And so where would we place them? And we started running scenarios, thinking of the idea of compensation. So if we want to do, if we want to bring more people, more workers, then there has to be a compensating act um, of building, for example, small gardens. And should we build them in the middle where there was more population? Or should we build them all around? So to create a buffer to protect the city from because the mining industry is placed outside and so all the pollution is brought by the wind um, and so try to create a sort of belt and buffer to protect this area and, and this way also mitigate no prevent some of the effects to happen and so we were looking into species and possible strategies um, to to be developed uh, at this border but also thinking a bit differently that uh, so that, for example, uh, workers and new people that would come to the area, instead of being allocated in um, housing settlements that were permanent, could live in something that was uh, that could be disassembled after they wanted to leave and just leave behind uh, some structures that were more uh, adapt for the for the specific landscape. 
Uh, we also did a workshop with MIT that was run by Alex Samis with Mark Goulter and others, uh, in which we were using composite materials to create these um, small houses for workers. And gray water, again, would be recycled so they could have small landscapes inside it. And once the operations were over, they would leave and leave these trees behind. So in a way, leaving a legacy on the territory instead of just a negative impact. Uh, impact. Uh, also, uh, this is a thesis project that I advised and was thinking about how to develop restoration project. Every time that a new project would come in, we would restore part of the oasis at the same time. And also, uh, this I think was really interesting. Imagine a future scenario for the city. So once mining operations are over, perhaps we could reuse the same infrastructure that now is exporting copper all over the world to bring in scientists, experts in uh, landscape reclamation that could help decontaminating this site and then spread the knowledge and create this type of network. No? So a kind of um, make Kalama, instead of being at the center of copper exportation, having it um, at the center of uh, reclamation studies. And so these strategies now that are really typical of landscape architecture, landscape planning, the idea of reclamation, restoration, mitigation, compensation, um, could become a sort of framework to think of the city and to think about uh, kind of reciprocal effects. So how to benefit different groups um, in order to meet the needs of another group. And, and so we were sharing this and see how this, in a way, landscape can become uh, the medium no? to orchestrate these different needs and create a community and also project it to the future, imagine possible futures. If there is to be a future, so this was the other thing that actually kept staying in our mind, no? So the main need for this company was to bring workers because they wanted to build new extraction sites and increase the industry. So they were predicting that, they are predicting that by 2040, about 85% of all the um, extraction activity will come from new mines. This means a lot of workers have to come on site in order to set this up. However, two possible scenarios also can happen in a not very distant future. On the one hand, here you see the dots. Chukikamata is the main mine that I was showing. This is another one uh, north that is now the biggest uh, mine in the area. And Minister Halis is a new one. So you see how basically they are all aligned and it's very possible that the very city of Kalama is rich in minerals underneath. And so one day it will be decided that it's probably not worth it to have a city here and it's better to start extracting the minerals from there. Um, so they might decide to relocate the whole town. Um, there have been discussions and studies about this too. And the other possibility is also that um, mining extraction will continue, but workers will not be needed. And this is also something that they are already working on. So basically they're predicting that they need up to 30,000 new workers um, until 2030, but slowly this number will decrease because most of the operations are going to be done underground mining and they can do this with robots. And these robots are um, controlled in their headquarters that are in big cities like Santiago de Chile or could even happen abroad. Um, so kind of all these scenarios that we were imagining about reclaiming and restoring and mitigating and compensating somehow um, imply that there is a city that wants to exist, that wants to remain there no? over time. But that might not be the case. Um, it can be that the city, if there is no need to keep extracting, there has, it has no need to be there, can be that it is relocated, or in any case, it might not need to grow. No, So it might be perfectly fine with what it has there. So this dashed line that you see are possible prediction with population and land use. And so we were thinking, OK, how can we? So we were kind of coming up with this more spe speculative scenario, um, which was dealing with the fact that maybe we just have to think about how can we re uh, reconfigure the whole system, no? 
So how can we instead think about mining cities as something ephemeral that has an expiration date and design accordingly? Um, so for example, designing a CAM, like the examples I was showing in the workshop that could host the needed workers um, for a certain amount of time and then could be transformed into something else. And mining companies are relatively interested in um, adopting the camp model because of course it doesn't have all the political struggle that bringing workers to a city has, but it's logistically not very efficient and it's very expensive because most of these units in which workers, these temporary units are prefabricated, they are built in the case of Chile in Santiago, so 4,000 kilometers or 2,000 miles away. They have to be brought with one truck, one house. And the final configuration is something like this, like really sad, workers are not happy. They don't have, it's very high altitude, so they don't have enough, enough oxygen which makes them defocused, not very productive. They have all these studies, no? Uh, so imagine how the architecture really influences productivity. And so, so we were thinking about this different model in which maybe there is a need to rethink temporary housing and these prefabricated units, instead of being a block that cannot be modified, maybe could be made out of panels, so different types so that we can achieve configurations that are that are richer from a spatial perspective and also that can be easily assembled and disassembled. Okay, so these were kind of scenarios no, of how this could move depending on the reason and also depending on climate conditions, whether you have to protect the camp from wind or get more sun or whether it is growing or shrinking and how can you readjust depending on that. But also uh, in the case, there is no more need for these camps to be there and there is no more need to have the workers there, but actually uh, this, most of the operations will happen in the city and we know that cities are growing. Perhaps these housing units could be moved and rebuilt elsewhere. And so this is a neighborhood in Santiago de Chile um, where the quality of housing is relatively poor. And so basically we keep thinking about mining as an investment in territory. And that's how also politicians sell it. Like we will bring 10,000 jobs, 20,000 jobs, we will bring infrastructure, but actually maybe the investment can be into housing that can be relocated once a life cycle is over. And and so, yeah, we kind of left them with this, um, with this perspective, no? with this speculative proposal. Um, so how can we think instead of think, keep thinking of um, housing and urbanism as something permanent, actually think about something dynamic and make sure that we can process the effects um, of this transformation of urbanization and industrial development. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to take more questions about this project. So this project, maybe you want to know what happened. So this was really food for thought for them. They were really interested in keep working on developing these proposals, although then the way they do business keeps being the way it is. Uh, but it really set the ground for um, productive conversation and possibly changing, especially in the case of the land use uh, of the area, like trying to find better ways to 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 um, offset some of the effects of uh, the mining uh, company and, and their contamination and their use of the territory. And I want to show you another project, and it's really different. And then I'm happy to like take questions and kind of discuss about um, commonalities and how really I think it's the same way of thinking through projects, no? So this project that I was showing you, that I just showed to you in Palama, for me was really seminal in trying to uh, develop a sort of methodology in which we always think about um, every urban process or industrial process uh, for its footprint and for its effect. And we try to incorporate in the project, um, to incorporate no, the externalities inside the project. And also we keep thinking about uh, the development over time. So we don't think about cities as something static, 
but we try to anticipate their future transformation. And so whether I was working on projects on the city of uh, Santiago de Chile, like I organized a couple of competitions and it was really important trying to have these lenses. Um, I had a project on seasonal landscapes um, on the coast. And so again, how can we think about uh, tourism as a sort of industry that is really occupying the territory in a seasonal way and how can we take advantage of it and so on. And I think it really also influenced the way we approach this project um, that is being developed right now. And it's a project that we are doing with the Inter-American Development Bank throughout Latin America. And in this case, the externality is not an industry, but it's actually at the global level, the impact of climate change. And we are working on developing a manual and a series of publications with case studies and strategies of green infrastructure to prepare informal settlements and precarious settlements uh, to climate change. Um, as you know, cities like New York are investing millions of billions of dollars in redoing their waterfronts, trying to improve their resilience, trying to build infrastructure that can help, for example, face sea level rise or absorb floods, increase their green areas and so on. Here are images from New York projects that are happening, that have happened. Uh, at the bottom, Houston also is doing some interesting projects on the Buffalo Bayou and Boston has a great plan about resiliency and transforming part of the southern areas into parts. Um, but what about cities that do not have these resources? No? This was really our uh, main focus. Um, in a way, this really raises issues of equality. This happens at the global scale and at the local scale. Those who are the most um, who, those who are the least responsible for generating the climate crisis because they are using the least resources, they are emitting the least say, um, greenhouse effect gases, are those who are impacted the most. So this map is how we actually started this project. And it shows in red and variations of red gradients of red, the um, level of vulnerability to climate change and the percentage that you cannot see very well uh, indicate the percentage of inter informality in the country. So with very few exceptions, countries that are the most vulnerable to climate change are also countries that have the highest percentage of people living in informal settlements. This is somehow also obvious because the, this index for vulnerability includes the capacity of a country to react to the effects of climate change. So if a country has a high percentage of people living in informal settlements with low access to resource and infrastructure, of course, they're less prepared. But it's also a sort of vicious circle. No? And for those of you who are, might not be familiar with the concept of informal settlements, um, it is one sixth of the world population lives in informal settlements. And there are several definitions, but the most common one is the one defined by the United Nations. And it defines the settlements, um, settlements in which inhabitants have no security over land or dwelling they inhabit. Um, also the neighborhood usually lacks uh, basic services and city infrastructure and housing might be illegal or may not comply with planning and building regulations or is settled in environmentally hazard areas, uh, may lack municip municipal permits and so on. Um, so these areas are already like affected by risk of high risk of infection, parasites, respiratory diseases, accidental fires, natural danger, contamination. And all these risks are just aggravated by the effects of climate change. So if you wanna see some pictures, if you don't have it very much in mind, but here are some images from Colombia, uh, Chile, Valparaiso. So you see that either it's areas that really have no green space or when they have, it might be at high risk of a landslide. Um, they really need uh, even mobility infrastructure in many cases. 
uh, you probably know this picture is one of the most famous picture, no? They might be really close to areas that are uh, very well developed and wealthy and yet have no resources, no? And I was struck a few weeks ago uh, by this picture. So Johnny Miller has this project called Unequal City and the name just resembled something when I saw this picture in Brooklyn after Hurricane Ida, Ida hit. So this is an image of a worker that had to leave his house anyways, despite the storm and go bring food um, to people who had placed an order in the middle of a hurricane. No? And so really many of these dynamics that we are seeing in informal settlements in Latin America actually replicate in different degrees in many places around the world, even in New York City in some specific uh, conditions. No? And as always, um, every time there is an extreme climate event, uh, for the poorest groups, the impacts are always the strongest. So there are some direct consequences. So they need to get out in order to have an income and they might lose this income if they cannot go out. They might lose all their belongings or their house might not be of enough good quality so they might be damaged more and so on. But there are also many less direct consequences. Um, for example, uh, if an extreme climate event happens, there might be less availability of water and food, and this might increase prices, and now they don't have accessibility to them anymore. No? So uh, this is something that might happen over time, but still is uh, extremely uh, relevant for these communities. Um, I believe you are all familiar with the main effect of climate change, but mostly we are looking at increase in temperature, um, an overall increase in temperature, but also increase uh, in the intensity and frequency of heat waves, which means many days with very high temperature. Uh, so by 2050, 1 1.6 billion people will face um, heat waves above 95 uh, degrees Fahrenheit for more than three months. So this has a very strong impact on population. And if the quality of housing is not good enough, you might have no retreat from it. Um, and this will, uh, well, that's also something that is kind of even more dangerous. So it, it will affect uh, billions of people and they estimate uh, it will have very hard at the effect 215 million people who are living in poverty. Um, sea level rise, we know New York is one of the most problematic cities for this, uh, but as we see like around the world, um, up to 340 million people will be strongly affected by sea level rise and also all across South America, th there will be more and more extreme events. So we will have to deal up to with up to six events in at the same time. And what does this mean? That in many cases, uh, if there, it's not possible to put people um, to recuperate some areas and have people uh, be safe, um, we will have to relocate or people will migrate on their own. No? So already 42 million people um, have been displayed for climatic reasons, which is about 10% of the world's migration. And it's predicted by 2050, 60% of the world migrants will be because of the climate crisis. So climate crisis is the co cause, but also in a way the consequence so for our issue in, that we are looking at. No? So most of these migrants will converge towards uh, bigger centers and unless countries are prepared to host them, they will very likely go feed the population in informal settlements because that's less control and they can easily find an accommodation. So what can we do? Among the many, many things that can be done to face this from a, at the political level, at the planning level, policy level, design level, uh, what, we were what we are looking at with this set of tools that we are building is um, public space and how can public space become a catalyst for urban regeneration but also for preparing um, these settlements uh, to face the climate crisis and be more resilient. Um, so we are trying to understand how nature-based solutions or green infrastructure um, can help these neighborhoods. No? Uh, 
while also improving their resilience, which make making them more prepared to face heat waves and floods, rising sea level, food scarcity, water scarcity. Um, here are some maps that show how, but we saw this on the pictures before also, no? And how it's almost directly proportional, the availability, the socioeconomic level of a neighborhood with their availability and accessibility to green areas and public space. And so the poorest neighborhoods have really few public areas and green spaces. And that's, of course, like a bit, you know, <laughs> because public space plays a fundamental role as a platform for civic action, exchange, empowerment. And so if we can also combine it with green infrastructure, it can, all, it can really become a medium through which uh, we can improve the social and environmental resiliency of these neighborhoods. Um, so some of the things that green infrastructure can do is they can manage rainwater because uh, plants, bushes, trees are able of absorbing water and will release it slowly. Um, it also filters water, so if there is a flood and there are some contaminated um, areas, for example, open air landfills, this uh, pollution goes everywhere and plants can help treat it. Um, also, uh, shade, they can create shade, so reduce the impact of heat waves, uh, retain humidity, um, can help biodiversity, which somehow helps the self-maintenance of these um, green infrastructure, help clean water, soil, and so on. No? So they really have multiple benefits. And in, co in context in which resources are so scarce and the space is so scarce, it's really important to be able to um, achieve the most with the least. Um, so what we're doing, we are looking at projects that are being developed um, already in these informal settlements. And we are also trying to understand, to give a framework uh, to look at this project now and keep doing them. Um, and basically we have individuated three transversal objectives that we really go back to even the extraction project. Now this idea of thinking in uh, about the city in a dynamic way and interscalar way. Um, so the first lens through which we are selecting projects is the idea of restoring and upgrading. Anytime a disaster happens, there, were, there will appear some resources from the city, from the region to fix it. So to restore some specific settlements. This also happens in case of areas that are particularly dangerous or somebody might start a project, no? So whenever we try to do this intervention to restore, we really have to try to upgrade the neighborhood. This has happened for many years now. It's kind of the trend since the 80s um, that every time an intervention is done in precarious settlements, you try to upgrade them. So build better, build again better. Um, and doing it with local inhabitants and with a sort of acupunctural intervention. So very specific uh, and very focused projects. So for example, the first project you see here, which was the image before, um, it's a small uh, promenade in one area and they use permeable pavement so that if, it's, if it rains, the water can go through. They also use permaculture, uh, which is a very intensive uh, way of doing agriculture to consolidate the hills and avoid landslide, but also uh, produce food that can feed the population. The same with many of other projects that we were looking at. For example, the Huerta and Manguinos in Rio de Janeiro is a very dry area, uh, but sometimes is affected by strong rainfalls. And so a vast area that was owned by an industry and that closed was donated to the city and to the neighborhood and transformed into the biggest um, orchard in Brazil um, that now provides gives food to 400 people in the neighborhood, created 20 jobs just for the people who maintained it daily and, and is reducing the budget of the families up to 20%. So this really has a strong impact, but also creates a place for social aggregation. Um, so this is, as I said, is really important at the scale of the community. It helps 
build the community and make them prepare and also face future rainfalls because the water instead of being lost will be absorbed in these uh, orchards and be and also in the water reservoirs no? and and we have food so they will be more prepared to face scarcity and so on however if we want to think about how to adapt cities to climate change no matter the neighborhood so these small interventions are useful up to a point but we have to uh, change establish a structural change uh, establish more ambitious projects that go beyond specific neighborhoods and that try to achieve integration and this is true for climate change it's true for urban planning and design no so the second group of projects we are looking at and that we are studying and we are uh, um, writing about and trying to understand all their benefits and so on really focus on connecting and adapting uh, you might know the project of the Parque Biblioteca España in Medellín. Mazzanti built this beautiful library, and there is a cable car that connects, um, that brings visitors and citizens to this area, which is really in the middle of a favela. A similar projects built in Mexico. Um, to like regulate the water in case of heavy rainfalls. So these projects are larger projects that are built with resources that come from the city or the region. They benefit the whole city, the whole metropolitan area, but they're built adjacent to these communities. No? So they have a, this double effect. They can achieve a much uh, larger impact. Uh, so, for example, uh, a similar project is in Medellin, the Recuperación de Morro Moravia is, was a big landfill that was transformed into a park. Um, or this project in Santiago de Chile that helps regulate the water of the river, uh, so preventing floods. It also has a bike lane that connects to the city center, but it's located in one of the most marginal neighborhoods. Actually, the image I showed before of the camp reorganized in a neighborhood it was the same neighborhood um so you see this is something it's somehow like saying if we want to solve the problems in new york city instead of doing uh, redoing the lower manhattan maybe we have to also intervene in the bronx or in harlem no um so you try to achieve really more things uh, by strategically tackling some areas um and that can benefit the whole metropolitan region and finally, the third lens uh, was the idea of anticipate and mitigate. So when we think about informal settlements or precarious areas, we always think about something that has to be fixed, but this is actually part of the urbanization process itself. No? So if there is not enough affordable housing or um, areas in which people can live um, having access to resources, they will keep happening no so even if some of these settlements are going to be fixed and are going to be improved and infrastructure is brought they will develop elsewhere um, because people still need an affordable place to live and they want to have their own uh, way of succeeding and providing for their children and so on um, so it's really important to to think about this of this projection in the future and as this reality as something dynamic the same way in which when we want to tackle the climate crisis and have an impact, we have to, yes, we have to adapt, but we also have to think about new ecologies, new economies, how we can change society in order to reduce emissions and, and really think in a different way. Um, so the same happens here. And so we really wanted to look for projects that were going beyond the neighborhood, beyond the big park, but really trying to think a different way uh, of leaving the city. And one project that go beyond boundaries that try to uh, offer different uh, mobility or um, yeah, really think a bit outside the box or much more ambitious even. Um, so for example, this project is a 42 kilometers so or I don't know, 22, 23 miles bike lane that connects uh, 20 municipalities in the city of Santiago. And it started piece by piece, negotiating neighborhood with neighborhood to make this happen. And now offers 
um, sustainable mobility throughout the city from the poorest to the richer neighborhood, connecting them to each other. And it's combined with the green infrastructure. Uh, it goes all along the river. So it really achieves a lot with one intervention. Um, in a similar way, the ecological park in Mexico City uh, wants to reclaim the water reservoirs in, the, in an area of the city that is rapidly developing. So there will be a lot of these communities that pop up um, from one day to the other and that uh, through this park, uh, basically they want to protect the most valuable resources, but also provide uh, infrastructure and recreational uh, activities for these communities. No? So we kind of achieve the both. And the same with the Corridor Socioecologico in the Cerro Oriental in Bogota. Diana Wiesner is a designer for this. It's sort of belt that prevents um, the settlements to keep expanding towards the hills, but also transform some of these areas into productive landscapes and social landscapes. So that actually is an active belt that people can inhabit and prevents them to develop further, but also gives them services. Or in Costa Rica, they are building a, a Ruta Naturbana, like a natural highway or big green infrastructure that is crossing the sea through really interesting partnership between private and public. So this crosses the whole city of San Jose. And while in the poorer areas like here, it's mostly made possible thanks to um, NGOs funding and public funding. But in other areas, like the image we saw before up there, um, it is real estate developers and private investors that are taking care of these areas um, as a sort of outdoor space of their own condominiums. Um, so again, piece by piece, negotiating one with the other, they're really building this uh, infrastructure that are connecting different neighborhoods and can redistribute resources and make um, all the area much more resilient because it can absorb uh, floods. Here you see some of the drains and the vegetation that also is part of the project. Um, so really multiple benefits are offered uh, through this uh, intervention no? and that can work at different scales. So we basically wanted to take all of these inputs and think about these three scales of the restore and upgrade and connect and 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 uh, adapt and mitigate and anticipate as a constant framework to think about even the smallest intervention and so here are some images of the manual we're putting together that is uh, really trying to give tools for people who are working in these communities or that have to implement projects for these communities that take all of this into account. So by redesigning the section of the street and selecting the vegetation, both in the dry season and in the wet season can provide more shade, can reduce, uh, prevent from heat wave, can um, collect water and redirect it, filtrate it, um, playgrounds that can transform into uh, water squares, like to retain the water, but still uh, it can still be possible to walk through them and using native uh, vegetation so that it doesn't need um, too much care and too much or too little water compared to the specific conditions. And wetlands, how they can also become an opportunity for um, for creating recreational spaces, but also uh, make the whole area more resilient, both in the dry and in the wet season, and what type. So we are trying to give these solutions this we're doing together with Ground Lab, which is an office based in London, and trying to look at like local materials and highlighting uh, the specific benefits and really designing the specific uh, sections that through, uh, in the end, going back to the material or the detail of the paving or uh, example of projects um, uh, that they can implement, uh, somehow go back to this idea of like improving the local conditions, but also building a much broader network that can uh, help prepare 
these neighborhoods and these cities for climate change. Um, yeah, squares and fields that can be floodable and uh, with small uh, islands and looking at what are the typical vegetation. So putting together a catalog and, and yeah, that's it. So the first of these book was published already. It's available for free. You can download it. It's done in Spanish, but the English version is about to be published too. And, and yeah, more specific volumes on the case studies with these three lenses I was describing and the manual uh, will are underdeveloped right now. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was that was really amazing. Um, I'm like sorry, but this was too long. <laughs> no, no, that was perfect. That was perfect. Um, does anyone have any questions? Do you want to? Do you want to bring up any discussion? Any questions? And uh, for everybody on Zoom, if you guys want to unmute yourselves or if you want to type it in the chat, however you feel most comfortable to um, bring up any any questions, feel free. Hi, thank you for your uh, lecture. I had a question regarding some of the prefabricated um, buildings that were built in, I think, Chile. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, uh, like, what were they made out of and like the construction process and also the fact that they were sort of being imported or like they weren't created on site and um, sort of my view of like sustainability or something that's uh, environmentally and uh, community building is sort of giving the people the ability to build their own homes and giving them sort of the ability to modify them and um, sort of create spaces that they have uh, a claim to rather than sort of importing this um, maybe foreign, maybe uh, mm -hmm. sort of prefabricated uh, structure. And I was just, I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about um, the design for these homes and how the community has resp uh, ha responded to them or, or how they um, mm -hmm. view them. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the question. It's like, a uh, great point that you're raising. Um, so the project, so if I am understanding correctly, you're kind of implying, so even the project we were developing, even if it's a kind of a speculative project, um, might still resemble a bit this idea of prefabrication. And so why not using more typical materials? Did I get it correctly? Yeah. Yes, okay. So. Basically, because the whole point, um, like one of the theses I was showing was kind of a combination of both. Um, it's sort of two different projects. So on the one hand, we were thinking about more um, territorial proposals, like with smaller interventions, like this idea of the thesis in which some of the prefabricated were disappearing and there were other elements remaining that were built uh, with materials and techniques that were typical of the indigenous constructions. Um, so this was also part of that. But the specific part of the camp, uh, this started on a project that was uh, actually led by um, someone else, uh, Alex Samis, which is now uh, at RPI. And it was a workshop done with MIT. And there the idea was to really work on innovating the material to serve to replace what was used by the mining companies right now. So it still had to do a, te a technology and the material that could be efficient and that could be easily assembled and disassembled and that could allow different configurations, but that it would have to be assembled on site by a few workers and be disassembled in the same way. So the whole project was trying to involve aspects of the logistic and from the company perspective. I don't know if that makes sense. So it was not really a project built with the community, but it was trying to offer alternative solution to a highly industrialized process remaining 
a highly industrialized process. And sorry. Um, we have another question by Sam in the chat. Uh, Sam, do you want to do you want to voice the the question, or or should we read it out? Yeah, I could ask it. Um, just basically, our studio at Cooper, we're looking at the rezoning of the Gowanus Canal right now, which is mm -hmm. kind of similar to some of the landscapes that you talked about in your lecture. It's also heavily polluted and former industry. And the only way that they can really get new public space is by having it be kind of a, a rider to this other mm -hmm. development of high-rise apartments that's mm -hmm. ultimately going to be much more profitable to the developer and that's most, mm -hmm. that's the only way you can get new public space in a city like New York and I was wondering what kind of ways there were for acquiring public space in the cities that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes yeah this is I mean this is a great point and is the point and I don't know if this connects also to the comment before no of course like if you want to be the most sustainable you do nothing like extraction should finish at all and so on but also at some point it depends on us we can be everything no we can be activists we can be advocate for things not happening or we can try to work with the system and every specific project like asks us to make decisions so in the case of the Govanus Canal, I know very well because <laughs> I don't live far from there. And yeah, of course, there is a lot of critic also coming with that because they will have to redevelop the whole area. And also um, right now the area is very industrial and a lot of developers would want this not to keep being, being so industrial anymore. There is also social housing there, and this is part of the identity of the place and the new development process would like to push this out. So, or at least marginalize it, even if they say they're doing something very diverse and very inclusive and so on, no? it's always the case. I guess it's always a negotiation process and the good design, of course, always has a better impact than bad design. So in that area in particular, like, the more they can negotiate that can actually be given back to the community, the better. So you can have a project in which the green that they're bringing is their private roof garden. And that's kind of completely useless, even if they can tell you we are absorbing CO2 emissions and that we are absorbing water and so on. Uh, but by other interventions in which, for example, the ground is made available to the public or one can actually walk through the buildings or uh, bigger buffer areas around the Goanus Canal are built. And, you know, so the more there is room for giving back to the community and to the collective, the better. Um, it it's, will probably not happen without development, no? And that's why I think I was really, and I am really interested in the project in Costa Rica. This project was put together by an NGO. They put together this association, a bit like the Friends of the High Line, let's say, um, in a very similar way. So they saw the potential for creating this road that would connect different neighborhoods. And they're trying to go to speak to different <laughs> um, stakeholders depending on their current needs. So they see that they need the real estate developers in order to make this happen in the city center. But they're hoping to, once a pro while the process is starting, then they're getting enough um, people supporting them so that they can actually make it happen throughout the city and redirecting public funds for that. So I don't really know the details for the Govanus Canal, but I think that the more every single intervention you are doing in your design projects, the more it can give back or be open, be accessible, be green intense, the better, no? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions?
uh, so I have a question. Um, I think it's really amazing what you brought to the communities and the town. And um, I was just curious, uh, for example, the, the agricultural garden, like the vegetable garden, mm -hmm. and you said that it brought it created new jobs and the workers. I'm like, first I'm curious if it's like privately owned or like who's paying the workers for, mm -hmm. so that it's getting managed. And uh, and yeah, I'm also curious if you know, but uh, if it, how is it getting managed? Like if it's still like very actively used or yeah. Okay. I'm not doing that, eh? <laughs> like this project oh, okay. that we're showing are case studies that we are learning from and that we are um, studying and trying to explain the process and how they made it happen uh, over time and the type of benefits they have so that people can learn from them. So it's not me, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> but I wish because they are amazing projects. So the, I think you're referring to the Huerta in Manguinos and that's a... Um, it started from a resident association working with a group of activists and they managed to um, so the workers uh, it's a um, co cooperative i see okay so through that it, it's really big like it has 300 uh, uh, gardens in it and the um, yeah they basically managed to make it become a small enterprise Thank you. We have one more question over here. Oh, um, maybe touching on the question Mauricio was asking before. Um, yeah, I was wondering what you think about the relationship between what you're saying is opportunities for private developers to invigorate the landscape with greenery or maybe a positive impact on the land um, versus the idea that the, um, like basically the the pushing of public or undesirable lands into private hands for profit is being tooled through architecture where it would be an undesirable land that perhaps the public can choose to act upon but through narratives of private development for net positive, there's sort of this exchange between a public ownership to a private capital ownership. And, and maybe you can talk about that in relationship to either the camp in the city or or these other smaller projects that you were showing where the undesirable land that was the public's became the privates through a promise of net positive. Okay. Um... Let's see. So you're wondering how this kind of agreement might start or whether I believe it's correct or? Yeah, maybe if you can just talk about what, like how they start, but also. Yes. Okay, so basically in the case of the, so always that kind of the land has to be managed in different ways, uh, depending on countries and what are their policy system for planning and so on. So in the case of the um, place we were working in Chile, in this community called Calama, um, the main issue was that they had a city planning um, office that was drawing urban plans, you know, deciding what's the land use for what, and they were always like 20 years behind. So basically what they were foreseeing as areas for future development, either they were already occupied in some way, or they were so close to more polluting areas um, that it wasn't relevant anymore, or people just went to live there. Uh, so they really had to think a bit in a different way and try to strategize on what are the most important things. For example, protecting the oasis, no matter what, uh, because that's a place that once you lose it, you have lost it. And then think about how you can renegotiate the rest of the place around, no? So for us, they were asking us for suggestions and it was like, okay, on the oasis, you cannot do anything. Like you just have to restore and recuperate. 
but on the other areas that are close to it, maybe you can see if you have like developments by um, uh, hotels that want to build there or some mining companies that want to build houses for their workers, etc. Um, maybe they can do that, but they will have to, in exchange, help you push forward a project for a park on the opposite side of the city that will benefit uh, the rest of the community. No, So trying to work with the whole area as a sort of board. And in the case of these other projects that uh, we were looking at uh, of the green infrastructure, it's often a similar thing, a similar thing. Like, for example, the, um, the bigger parts that I was showing, and I know much better the case of the project in Santiago, um, this big park that is built in a marginal community. So this wouldn't be possible without the funds of the metropolitan region. So like the community itself would not be able to afford it. Um, so the idea is to have a bigger park that the government can sell it as a park that is benefiting the whole city and it's placed there because that's actually the area that needs it the most. But it's also protecting the whole community because it regulates water and it creates a bigger green infrastructure and so on. So in a way you try to have everybody on board and it depends on the system. So for example, in, in this city and that's why it was really interesting on the other hand, the green infrastructure, which was also a bike lane for 42 kilometers, you know, collecting 20 municipalities. For example, in the case of Chile and that was also the problem with Calama, um, ah, actually it's two different problems. But anyways, um, at the city level, every municipality uh, has to do things with their own taxes. So if a place is poor, we'll remain with poor infrastructure because people will not pay a lot of taxes and they will not have enough resources to invest in the public realm. And so this type of bigger project is the only way to actually redistribute resources. Does it make sense? Yep, thank you. And in the case of New York, I think something similar is how, and whenever we think about the climate crisis and the resiliency and so on, we really know that we are part of one community, you know? So there are often incentives and ways to make things happen that will benefit uh, the larger public and the bigger community um, that usually might not go through, no? So, of course, yeah, it's always a negotiation and it depends who has most of the power. But uh, we were trying to look for examples that were successful in building new different type of agreements. Um, I think we're just about out of time unless anybody has any other closing comments or any other questions. Well, uh, thank you, Jeanette, for, for joining us and for being the first speaker in the in the student lecture series this semester. It's really exciting to have you. Um, thank you. And thank you so much for having me and for your questions and comments. And yeah, I, I would love to also see your work, how it's doing. I, I love it to be invited by students who are in the middle of their semester. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.